not heard of me before. Um, I am based at Embassy Church and with uh, Pastor Ken Fisher, who's on our start executive. And Ken oversees the regional works in New South Wales, which is really convenient for me, seeing that most of what I do is itinerant. And I'm on the board of Western Air Care. I'm the Secretary Treasurer. Uh, I'm also on the board of the Wilcannia Living Waters Church, of the Wilcannia um, Relief Project called Wilpro. Um, we've also started a new initiative called the Western Region Indigenous Leaders Discipleship Initiative, which really what we're trying to do with that is to take the advantage of what we've started in Wilcannia and uh, gather other Indigenous leaders together. There's a, there's a lack of that that's happened in, the, in historically where we haven't been raising up Aboriginal pastors and Aboriginal leaders. And because we've got such a great network of people involved with that, and we've got Pastor Willie Dermis, who's part of the National Initiative for um, Aboriginal Works and Indigenous Works, um, we decided that that would be a great thing to do. Uh, all of these things are in early stages at the moment. Um, I'm also on the board of the Ningan Church uh, and I'm on the oversight of the Gulgandra Church. So, um, and I run a business. I uh, work about 55 or 60 hours a week in an air conditioning business. Anyone wants to buy it, let me know. I'll be really pleased to see you. Um, uh, so that's what we get up to. Um, I, I'd like to say thank you for having us today. Monica and I are always blessed. We love your worship. We love the spirit of your church. And there's some places that we go and you've just got such a heart for the things of God. And that makes so much difference to us as uh, as um, what we would call ourselves, as people call us missionaries. but that's a bit strange because we don't really go overseas, but we do spend a lot of time traveling to other churches. Um, I think uh, it was quite relevant. And I'd have to say to Sarah, Sarah, I love your shoes today. Your shoes are amazing because your feet are prepared with the gospel. And that's the point. That's the, the point. Your shoes are wonderful. Um, uh, it's always such an honor to be with you guys. I know I've said that before. And I do bring greetings from Pastor David Jackson, who's the head of Western Air Care. Um, we've recently uh, had a few things to do with uh, drought relief and with um, farmers relief. We've taken some hay and some feed up into far north Queensland and to north Queensland, uh, western Queensland. Um, there is, uh, the farmers are, are actually um, just recovering from a mouse plague and we've just got some stores ready. We're concerned that by the end of winter, we're going to run out of some feed. So we're gathering some things we are planning to be in that. Jacko makes contact with just about um, all of the farmers that we've, uh, Jacko is Pastor David Jackson, of course. He makes contact with most of the farmers on a regular basis. Once every three or four months, he might ring them. Um, because the objective of actually what we do is uh, as like a good Samaritan type of process. And I'll be sharing about that in a minute for you. Um, and, and so what we desire to do is we want to show people the love of Jesus by reaching out to them, meeting them at their point of need. Um, we got involved with Wilcannia because uh, Pastor Jackson, uh, Jacko, of course, is also the, uh, the assistant regional leader in the Western region of New South Wales. And that area virtually runs from not far from the other side of the Blue Mountains uh, up towards Narrabri and across to Broken Hill. Um, and so there's about seven or eight uh, independent uh, ACC churches and there's some that are parts of other um, of the uh, generosity church group. The regional leader is the head of the generosity group. Um, and so we work together. Um, uh, Caleb, who's the regional leader, is also on the board of the uh, Wilcannia Church and also on the board of the uh, Western Region Indigenous Leaders Discipleship Initiative. So we're LD as we're trying to call it. Um, and so you guys would have to be one of our most committed supporters, just to let you know. And we don't base uh, the commitment of someone on the monetary value or on the exposure that they give us. We base it on the regular, the consistent and the uh, persistent. And you guys are persistent, you're consistent, and you're just always regular with your correspondence and with your love for what we're doing. And we know that the Lord is going to bless you for that as a church and as individuals. So um, to give you a bit of an uh, uh, idea what we're doing in Wilcannia, we've purchased, Western Air Care has purchased the Anglican Parish Hall. We got that through. It took us about 18 months. Everything to do with Wilcannia, by the way, everything takes longer, is harder, has more challenges. 
Um, and that's part to do with the history of Wilcannia um, and part to do with what's happening there in the town, which I'll explain in a minute. But we actually, um, we purchased the parish hall. Uh, there's a beautiful old sandstone building that the Anglicans own and the parish hall was a 200 square metre, uh, virtually a um, corrugated iron shed, but it's a well fit out, it's, in, it's internally lined, it's got a kitchen and some bathroom facilities. It has, also has a four bedroom um, manse or rectory uh, at the back of the property. Um, and that needs new bathrooms, new kitchen. Um, it's, uh, it's in good condition for Wilcannia, but you wouldn't want to live there. Um, and that's on 2000 square meters of land. So we've got plenty of space. We've got a big garage on there. And what we're planning on doing that is we've got, uh, it's, things get delayed because of COVID, which has been a real shame. But what we're planning on doing uh, as a care organization, because we need to provide relief of suffering because we're a deductible gift recipient charity, is we desire to uh, start a soup kitchen because we want to reach out and provide meals, uh, especially during the latter part of the winter. Um, maybe twice a week we'll, we'll provide that. That's what the plan is at the moment with the guys that are on the ground. They can't do much at the moment um, because they've got their own restrictions because of COVID. Um, and then we're going to provide services for the community in relation to, there's nothing really much for the kids to do after school. So some after school care, uh, some after school uh, activities for the children. Um, the, the new overseeing pastor of the church, a guy called Grant Hayes, who's the Indigenous leader from South Australia, he travels from Cardina, which is in South Australia, to Wilcannia, when it's not in lockdown, um, once uh, every two weeks. And he's actually a, um, he's been saved for probably 30 years. Um, he's an ex, he spent time inside, he spent many, many years as a, uh, as a uh, chaplain in the prison network. Um, and he has a real ability to relate to the locals. And we've got young Robert and Natika uh, Clayton, who are our on-site leaders and pastors. And there's about probably half a dozen regulars in a town of 700 and, well, it's called 750, but the township has 550 people in it. And they're about two thirds indigenous. Um, the problem that you have in Wilcannia specifically is for many years, it was a dumping ground for misplaced indigenous people that were part of the stolen generation or people that were taken away from their um, original place of uh, where they were residing. So back in the, in the days, in the dark old ages, when uh, our government chose to uh, not acknowledge the Aboriginal people as a race of human beings, um, they would actually take people from other parts of the state or other parts of the region and then put them into Wilcannia. And what that happened with that is you had then multiple people with different uh, languages. They didn't understand each other. There was a lot of conflict. Um, and even today, there is still virtually three different parts of the town. There's what they call the, the mission, which is the, um, the old Catholic mission. Um, there's the main part of town where a lot of the Europeans live. Um, which is, you know, as I said, about 25, 30% of the, of the population. Uh, and then there's what they call the Mallee. And the Mallee is where the, uh, it's more of a tribal type of location. Um, the issues that we have in Wilcannia is that the average male lifespan is 37 years old. The crime rate for, uh, for uh, violent crime, uh, non-domestic violent crime, is about 47%. Uh, which is the total amount of crime that takes place for that. There's drug and alcohol related issues, ice, um, marijuana, of course, uh, and just booze. Um, there is a lack of hope amongst the people. 50% um, of homes don't have a locking front door because the door has been broken down and no one's there to fix it. Um, the figures are 50% uh, of, of homes in Wilcannia don't have access to the internet. 27% of the population is over the age of 50, and 30% uh, of the homes have extra purse people outside of their family living in their homes because there's a housing shortage. 30% uh, of homes don't have electricity uh, or don't have or have electricity or plumbing problems, and 25% of households don't have a car. Uh, there is one shop in town, it's an IGA store, and the IGA store opens virtually when it wants to. The service station, the main service station in town, um, there's two service stations, one's on the main road and one's off to the side where 
the truckies go when they need when they know to go there. Um, but the main service station has a roadhouse. That is the only, there's only two places in town that have public toilets and one is that roadhouse and their toilets haven't worked for five months because they can't get a plumber to come to town. So you've got those issues that take place, but you've also got an issue where, see the, the, the people are called the Bakinji, which is, uh, the, that's their tribe. And it's because the name of the town is Barker. That's their uh, Aboriginal name, which is Big River. And the, the issue is, is that they worship their, uh, the, the, the river serpent. Um, and there is actually a fair amount of, uh, amongst the, uh, the people that haven't been exposed to Christian Christianity and those that have, there is a fair amount of witchcraft that takes place and they have, uh, they practice that's part of their inherited culture. And I think it's part of their original culture because when you sit down and talk with Aboriginal people, they actually are very open to the things of the spirit. Um, we've had meetings there and people come in and recommit their lives. Just about everyone in town has actually at some point heard the gospel, which means it's just a, it's like they're like a sponge. If you go there in the right heart with the right spirit and you have, uh, and you're working in love, the people in town are amazing. They just want to be part of what we're doing. And, uh, but there's so much distrust because for so long, there's been people with the wrong intentions going in there. There's been oh, seven or eight churches fail in this town. Um, and most of those churches have failed because the pastors or the leaders or the ministers have actually fallen into sin. Um, and so there's a really bad history. Uh, when we got asked to get involved, uh, Chris Smith, who's our state secretary of the ACC, asked us to, to establish the church effectively. Um, and you know, when someone asks you the question, someone asked me recently, why do I go to Wilcannia? Why do I drive 11 and a half hours to go to Wilcannia, um, to a town that's so small with you know a church of six people, so for example. Um, and I just thought about it. I thought, well, number one, I was asked. So to me, I've been sent. So that's a good thing. And number two is that I went there the first time and I saw the need. And I don't think I've ever seen a place, like I spent, you know, five years doing outreach in King's Cross. I led the King, the outreach, the commandos outreach in King's Cross for three years. I, I've seen some dark places. I've come from some dark places myself. You know, Pastor Michael made a comment before and he talked about Gideon. And Michael doesn't know that the prophetic word that was spoken over my life as a, as a new believer was a mighty man of valor. Gideon had 300 and it went on from there. So Gideon to me is a very important story. A lot of people make Gideon out to be a um, to be a, someone who was afraid, but you've got to recognize, as Michael was saying, the Midianites at the time when they were they were persecuting uh, the Israelites, they would actually kill people. They'd kill the Israelites for providing food. They'd that actually they stopped them from growing grapes. They stopped them from growing wheat. And here's here's our friend Gideon. He goes and gets gathers together enough wheat and he says, where am I going to thresh this wheat? Where am I going to take the wheat, wheat stalks and get the wheat out of it? So he thought, I know, I'll go and find a wine press. And so he got inside a wine press and started threshing the wheat. I mean, this man was full of courage. He wasn't someone that didn't have courage. He was a mighty man. And that's what the Spirit of God does for us. See, the boldness that comes upon you when the Spirit of God is within you and you are surrender to the things of the Lord that are in your life, when you submit yourself under the, word, under, the, under the Word, gives you the capacity to rise up and to do something. And often we don't rise up because we don't feel that we've been sent or we've been asked. Before I get on to a little short word, um, we went to Wilcannia in uh, Easter time, sweetheart. Monica and I went up and... You know, before we left, we got given a shopping order at the last thing. And so when the Aboriginal people, they don't, they're not necessarily the most highly organised people. Um, and so they gave me a shopping list at six o'clock on Thursday night. Does anyone remember what time the shops shut on Easter Thursday? So, so, so I had to go to, I think I went to Woolworths twice, Aldi twice, Coles. I went everywhere to try to get to fulfil this shopping list because they, they want to know they can trust you. And so we took the food and groceries and what was required for the weekend. We bought them for the, for the gathering of the church. Um, and I went and bought those. And because we were delayed, we got a bit of a late start the next day. 
it took us uh, an extra five hours to get to Wilcannia that weekend because of Easter traffic. Um, and we get up there, it was a real challenge to get there. We get up there one o'clock in the afternoon. We worked all day on the building because this is the new building that we've, that's been purchased and there's lots of issues with it. As I said, it needs a new bathroom, new kitchen, painting, floor coverings, the church building needs to be painted. And you know, there's some bathroom work and kitchen work in that, which is great. We do have some money for that. And what you do with supporting us goes towards helping with that as well. Um, so we get up there and we work the afternoon and then they said, oh, we'll, we'll do dinner. And we'd taken some lamb chops and they cooked these lamb chops on a, on a piece of metal that was in a ring shape with a, with a mesh over it on top of an open fire that they made on a piece of corrugated iron. And then this lady um, who'd be in her fifties, uh, uh, Dodie, she actually cooked these lamb chops on this piece of, uh, piece of uh, mesh, you know, chicken mesh uh, that, that they'd made up um, and in the dark uh, on the coals and they made salads and we sat around the fire and we ate with them. It was the best food. I mean, we were hungry, don't get me wrong but it was the best food ever. They actually know how to live. They know how to relate. They, they really, really have a passion for things. So then we preached the next day and then we had, I think it was uh, eight adults in the meeting, you know, apart from us and about 14 children. And, uh, and then we, um, we, we stayed, spent some time in the afternoon and then we drove home. And I actually said to Monica afterwards, I said, she said to me, how are you? And I said, you know, I actually feel that I've arrived in, in the things in the kingdom of God. I actually feel like I've stepped into my calling. And she said, why is that? And I said, well, I can relate to how Jesus might have felt, right? Relate to. I'm not saying I know how he felt. I relate to how he felt. Because we gave up our weekend. We paid all the money to get out there. We paid for all the fuel for the 2,000 kilometer journey. We paid for all of our accommodation. We paid for everything for the church for the weekend. We went out, we preached to eight people. We had an amazing encounter with God that weekend. And then we drove home. There was nothing in it for us at all. There was nothing in it for us. It was all giving. And as Sarah has said before, that's what, that's what missions is about. You know, Jesus gave his only son. You know, in, in uh, Matthew 18, it says, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make, dis make disciples of all nations baptizing in the name of the Son and the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you and I'm with you always. I love to preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel to me, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Of me. I know it is the power of God and the salvation for all that believe. And I'll challenge everyone at any given occasion, all of you out there, if you can find one scripture verse, something that speaks to you and you can share it with someone, that's what gets people saved. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It never returns void. It always fulfills its purpose. But when we need an opportunity to preach the word, sometimes we've got to do something else. And sometimes that doing something else is supporting someone like Jesus cares. I've got a friend who's been saved now 30 years. He wouldn't be here with us today if it wasn't for Jesus cares. They took him off the street. They helped him get off his drug habit. They helped him to actually get himself involved and do a trade and you know, Nick struggled for a long time, a long, long time. But because of the love of Jesus that was shown through people that were willing to care, Nick survived and he made it. And that's a personal experience. I'm sure there's thousands more of those. You know, we, we see a, a great opportunity to be good Samaritans. And I think that's what a lot of what Missions Work starts off as. You've actually got to build a bridge with people. And that's what we're trying to do in Wilcannia. Wilcannia's needs are enormous. Wilcannia, the people of Wilcannia are suffering. You sit there and you speak with them and especially when you pray with them, you feel the pain, the generational issues. There's so many of the adults there that have come out of the, out of the stolen generation and they've actually suffered things beyond measure. But I look at this when Jesus sent, you know, the, the, the passage of the Good Samaritan is a great passage and you've got to look at where it is actually, uh, wh where it is placed in the book of Luke. Because at the start of the book of Luke, it says the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them out two by two. He goes on in verse two and says, the harvest truly is great, the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So we think about that. We want to preach the gospel. We want to send out laborers. It goes down and of course, in, in, uh, in, in chapter nine, verse nine, it says, and heal the sick there. You know, there's a reason 
why you guys have a Friday night healing meeting, apart from Sarah's passion for it and Michael's support of it, is because God wants the opportunity to reveal his power. He wants to see that. He wants you to be able to step out and to encourage people to be involved in the work of the kingdom of God. See, being a disciple of Christ is actually being that, a disciple of Christ. Be like him, do what he did. And so he healed the sick. He had compassion on people. He cared for people. He says here in, in the verse that we go on with the, with in, in uh, Luke chapter 10, the 70, in verse 17, the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. If you'd like to see where that's been said, you look up at Isaiah 14, verse 12. It's really, that book of Isaiah from 14, 12 is really worthwhile reading. It, says, it actually goes on to say, they'll look at him, Satan, and they'll say, it was you? You're the one? You know, there's a, there's a power that Jesus said, because he's turned around and he said, I give you, and this is for you, each and every one of us today. I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. When it comes to missions and when it comes to being a good Samaritan, that's what he's talking about. I've given you all the power to do it. You go out and you love people, you care for people, you give. If you can't go, then give what you have. Now that what, what you have might be $3 a week. It might be five. You might have to go without a coffee once a week. And if that's all it takes, that's all it takes. You've got to start somewhere. And I know you're a generous church and I know that you give. You know, it's obvious that you love the Lord because you wouldn't experience worship like that, like you had before, if it wasn't that you love the Lord. We know that. Monica and I value every time we can. We, we regret it. We were disappointed we couldn't be there with you today. But it was just as good here with your worship, wasn't it, Mon? Man, it was awesome, you know. Here's the, here's the verse of scripture. It goes on, of course, and the disciples were there. And a certain lawyer stood up wanting to test Jesus. This is in, this is in uh, Luke 10, verse 25, and said to him, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit, to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written of law? What's your reading of it? And so he answered, this is the, the lawyer. He said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you've answered this rightly. Do this and you will live. But of course, the lawyer wanting to justify himself said, and who is my neighbor? And of course, Jesus goes on to tell the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, the funny thing is, this passage of scripture about the Good Samaritan comes after Jesus talking about going out and preaching and healing. So why is he saying that? Why is it that the Good Samaritan chapter, the verse of that, the, the, the passage, which I'll read part of it to you, about doing good to people, taking care of people in need, why is it that that comes straight after, go and preach the gospel, go and heal the sick? Why is it? Because we've got to have the opportunity to touch people at their point of need. And if you touch people at their point of need, which may be buying a beanie, it may be buying a, a bag of groceries and sending it to KL's place, if that's where it's going. Wherever it's going, that may be all you need to do. And if you were to do that with all of your heart, soul, strength and mind, because that's what Jesus is asking you to do, to surrender yourself. I've got a cross up behind me on the wall. I got that because I got saved on that verse of scripture. It was, if you want to follow me, Take up your cross and deny yourself. Do you know why my cross is on its side? Because it's not standing up on the ground. Jesus fell off. They took him off that cross. It was on the ground. He left it on the ground to, as an example to me so I could pick it up and carry it. So I could do what I needed to do with it. Deny myself and follow him. The scripture says that Jesus humbled himself unto the point of death, comma, even the death of the cross. Jesus was dead to himself way before he had to carry that cross up the hill and before he was crucified. Way, way, way before that. And what he's called us to do is to do that, to give of ourselves, to surrender of ourselves. You know, in the, in the passage of the Good Samaritan, it says a certain man, 
a certain, Jesus said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. That means any man. He fell among thieves. He got beaten up, thrown in the corner. And put in the side of the gutter. And then, of course, a Levite went past him. Took to, on the other side of the road. Priests went, jumped on top of the road. They didn't want to have to go anywhere near this guy with me. And then a certain Samaritan. Why is it a Samaritan? Why? I thought, why a Samaritan? What does that mean? And the Hebrew, Samaritans are actually watch people, watchmen. A certain watchman. A certain person from a tribe of people that were known for watching. In other words, they had their eyes open. They had their eyes open. There's a need here. And they had compassion. And they were moved with compassion. Jesus would, was moved with compassion and they, he healed people. It's compassion that God wants to rise up in our heart. And you know what? I've learned one thing. As you sow, so shall you reap. If you get moved with compassion to do something, even if it's the smallest thing, please do it. Because as you step out being moved by compassion, God will rise up. It's compassion, you know. He'll rise up in your heart and you'll get passionate to do more of what he's called you to do. Why do you think I get so excited and I'm so passionate about what I do? Because of that thing that's behind me. Because of the life that Jesus has given me. And I know for a fact that I don't deserve the life I'm living today. I don't. I don't have the capacity to be involved with all of the ministries and all of the activities and all of the things that I do. I don't have the capacity to do that. But I know when I die to myself and I take up that cross, Christ gives me the ability to do it. Jesus said, when it came to the Good Samaritan, he said, which of the three was neighbour who fell among the thieves? And the, and, the, and the lawyer said, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. You guys are an amazing church. And you are a generous church and a giving church. And you have a part, heart and a passion for missions and for the things of God. And you love the Lord. Continue doing what you're doing. And go and do likewise. May you let, may you let me pray for you. Father, I just thank you for such a wonderful church as Cornerstone, for its leadership, for its submissive uh, and submitted members. That, that even the leadership is submitted to those that they serve. And Father, I thank you that you are going to continue to bless this church and you're going to inspire them this week in this current lockdown to step out and to do something with compassion that they haven't done before whether it's sewing for the uh, sewing something into one of the missions programs, whether it's considering being part of a missions trip that we're organising in the days ahead when we can go, whether it's being part of encouraging someone, ringing Pastor Michael up or Sarah and saying, you're doing a great job. But Father, above all else, may we be moved with compassion for those that are in need. We thank you, Jesus. Amen.